Father's Day. May the Lord bless your day. Your family take you out and you have your shrimp and broccoli and french fries, your favorite meal, and enjoy your day. Because that was one thing that God had given man, especially if he becomes a father, a big responsibility. And God looks at us fathers as one of his greatest creations, because you are the starting point on your children and the next generation serving God. So when you serve God, you teach, you teach your children to serve God, it perpetuates, it goes on and on and on. And that's what God wants us to do. So that's why, and uh, we'll get into this when we do our family life ministry. God holds man at a higher and greater responsibility and accountability than the woman. Amen. Now, I know you should say, what? No, Amen. it's a greater and higher responsibility yes. on the man. But we're not going to talk about that today. Today, we're going to talk about resistance to boundaries. And see, one thing about resistance to boundaries we can control our own destiny. Nobody else can control your destiny but you. And if you allow things to happen, then you're letting others control you. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We can bring up the PowerPoint, resistance to boundary. Because with resistance to boundary, people are going to try you. And People like to try other people because they want to control people. You know, you have those who have this sense of, of accomplishment or achievement when they can control people. Remember what Tiger Woods used to say? <clears throat> and Tiger Woods had that kind of boundary that he can control people. He was talking to a, a reporter, and he said, now watch this. Let's move over here. So he and the reporter moved over here. You know what the crowd of people did? They moved right over with him. He had control. And he was controlling their boundaries. 
But let's look at, and we're going to pick up on page two. Let's, and Brother McKinney is going to be reading for us this morning. So Brother McKinney, let's just read the first two paragraphs to, to, to begin our opening on our lesson this morning. It's page 269. And we're on page 269. We have talked about the necessity of boundaries and their wonderful value in our lives. In fact, we have all but said that life without boundaries is no life at all. But establishing and maintaining boundaries take a lot of work, discipline, and most of all, desire. The driving force behind boundaries has to be desire. We usually know what is the right thing to do in life, but we are rarely motivated to do it unless there's a good reason. That we should be obedient to God, who tells us to set and maintain boundaries, is certainly the best reason. But sometimes we need a more compelling reason than obedience. We need to see, we need to see that what is right is also good for us. And we usually only see these good reasons when we are in pain. Our pain motivates us to act. So sometimes you will set boundaries when you're going through a pain or you're going through a storm or you're going through trials and tribulation. And why? Because you didn't set boundaries. And because you didn't set boundaries, guess what? Life is going to make you set some boundaries. But why go through the excess pain if you don't establish it first and God gives us his word to help us to set the boundaries. But what we have to realize, oops, it's going too fast. What we have to realize, you set your boundary, but someone's going to try to get in that boundary to control you or to get you to do what they want you, what they want themselves to do, but they need you to do it. One thing that we find ourselves at times is we are resisting our own boundaries while there's also an outside force of others around us who is also trying to res resist your boundary by trying to get in. And here it is, you putting up your resistance to not let them in, but if you're not protecting, protecting your boundary properly, they're going to come in. And then, or you're going to go out of your boundary and then you're going to do something that's going to have consequences on the end. Everybody follow what I'm saying? So it's just like uh, Paul told his disciples in 1 Corinthians 11, follow me as I follow Christ. So we need to follow someone that's going to not let us go astray to the point that there's going to be consequences. And most consequences aren't joyful. It could be painful also. Okay, let's, let's pick up, Brother McKinney, let's pick up on page 70, and let's read that last paragraph. But we are the one on page 270. But we are the ones who have to do battle. The battles fall into two categories, outside resistance and inside resistance the resistance we get from others, and the resistance we get from ourselves. You know, because, see, we're warring against the flesh. And, you know, what the Paul says, you know, the flesh is weak. And then when he also says, I know what I should do, but I don't do it. And, see, we're resisting our own boundaries on the inside as well as we're getting resistance on the outside. So let's look at the outside resistance. Outside resistance can come from anybody. It can come from in your home, on your job, in school, and even in church. So there's a lot of outside resistance also, but we have to maintain our stance so that it does not pull us out of our relationship, especially with God. It can pull you out of a relationship with your spouse, with your children, with your co-workers and your friends, but mainly it can also pull you out of your relationship with God. So we're looking at Julia. 
Let's read the first two paragraphs on page 270 about Julie. Outside resistance. Julie had had a difficult time with boundaries most of her life. As a child, she had a domineering father and a mother who controlled her with guilt. She had been afraid to set boundaries with some people because of their anger and with others because of the guilt she would feel for hurting them. When she wanted to make a decision for herself, she would listen to other people's anger or pouting and let their reactions affect her decision. Coming out of this family, she married a very self-centered man who controlled her with his anger. Throughout her adult life, she alternated between being controlled by her husband's anger and by her mother's guilt trips. She was unable to set limits on anyone. After many years, depression caught up with her, and she ended up in one of our hospitals. And see, this is from outside resistance. So we're going to look at some of the things from outside resistance that causes us to, at times, lose who we are or forget who we are. Number one, anger. Then we're going to look at guilt messages, consequences and counter moves, physical resistance, pain of others, blamers, real needs, and forgiveness and reconciliation. See, one thing, and we're going to look at the first one, anger. With Julie's case, when she wasn't doing what her parents required of her, what did her parents do? They get angry. So let's look at the anger or angry reaction. Is angry a sin? No. no. It's an emotion God has put in us. But what is the reason for anger? Why do you get angry? It's an emotion. But what does that emotion indicate? Something is wrong. Very good. Anger is an uh, indicator that something is wrong. But how you deal with that anger, you can deal with it godly or ungodly. But let's look at some of the anger reaction in Proverbs 19.19. 19. And this is from the Good News Bible. If someone has a hot temper, let them take the consequences. If you get them out of trouble once, you will do it again. What's that saying? What, what, what does that mean? When someone is angry, they're going to show it physically. You can see these expressions on their face. This is hot anger. This is wrath anger. But one thing about this kind of anger, you know these people are angry. You know they're angry because the expressions show it. But there's also an anger that's, that's even more, and to me, more dangerous than this. I know you're angry. I can see it. But what about the person that's calm? But I'm angry. What do you think they're doing? They waiting, and that's the one that will surprise you the most. Now, somebody coming to you like this, oh, I know how to handle you, okay? But if somebody comes to you very calm, collective, and cool, that's the dangerous one. But as I said, anger is not a sin, but it's how you deal with your anger that can cause you to sin. So let's, let's look at uh, anger reaction. Anger reaction, whoop, let me go back. Let's drop down on page 271, angry people. 
Brother McCain, we're on page 271. Let's drop down to the, almost the last paragraph. Angry people. Angry people have a character problem. If you reinforce this character problem, it will return tomorrow and the next day in other situations. It is not the situation that's making them angry, but the feeling that they are entitled to things from others. They want to control others, and as a result, they have no control over themselves. So when they lose their wish for control over someone, they lose it, they get angry. And see, one of the angry reactions that people will give you is when they hear, the, hear what word? No. A two-year-old does that. They get angry when they hear no. Adults get angry when they hear no. And like the author says, angry people have a character problem. Character is a learned behavior. You learn how to get angry. You just don't up and all of a sudden, oh, I'm angry. What are you angry for? Where, where'd you learn that from? Where'd you get that from? It is a learned behavior. So when you get angry, when you can't get your way, you learn how to do that. And where do you learn this kind of behavior from? Well, home, because your first Mm-hmm, because you learn it from an example, the three E's. <clears throat> what, what's the other two E's? You, your environment, and the third? Experience. Your experience, very good. That's how you learn some of your behavior, from your environment, your example, and your experience. And the first example is who? Your parents. Your parents. So that's why parents, you got to be careful how you react in front of your children. If you, ah, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to they gonna do the same thing because they saw you when you can't have your way. You slam the book down or slam the door or scream. Guess what? They're going to do the same thing because it is a learned behavior. Okay, let's continue. Let's go down to, uh, to, the, to the next one, the first thing. The first thing you need to learn is that the person who is angry at you for setting boundaries is the one with the problem. If you do not realize this, you may think you have a problem. Maintaining your boundaries is good for other people. It will help them learn what their families of origin did not teach them, to respect other people. Second, you must view anger realistically. Anger is only a feeling inside the other person. It cannot jump across the room and hurt you. It cannot get inside you unless you allow it. Staying separate from, other, from another's anger is vitally important. Let the anger be in the other person. He will have to feel his anger to get better. If you either rescue him from it or take it on yourself, the angry person will not get better and you will, not be, in, and you will be in bondage. And so here the author said the first thing is, a person that's angry, that's not your problem. Whose problem is that? It's their problem. And secondly, their anger cannot hurt you. It can't jump out, but you got to be careful because some people's anger will lead them to physically or verbally hurt you. But we're going to talk about how to deal with that because, see, if a person is angry, you have to learn how to, number one, to protect yourself because sometimes the anger can move to either physical or verbal. And it's not to say that it's, it's completely unavoidable. Sometimes you can't avoid it, avoid it at all. It's going to happen. But the only thing you have to make sure is you don't react to it. How many people it takes to argue? Well, argue is when it's between two people. 
but it takes at least two people. How many people does it take to fight? Two. And if you don't react to them, they can't do it. You take away their power. So that's what you want to do. You want to take away their power. So let's look at the third thing. Third, do not let anger be a cue for you to do something. Right People, there. Let's, let's, let's hold that. Don't let that <laughs> anger be a cue for you to do something. Because, see, their anger is their problem. But their problem is, you told me, no, you're not going to do what I want you to do. And I'm angry. Now, now let me ask this question. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. How many of us have gotten angry? How many of us have gotten angry to the point, I'm out of here. <laughs> we all have went through that. But how many of, no, I'm not going to ask that question. But anyway, anger is an emotion that you can control. And we got scripture for that too. Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, and that wrath is anger. And that anger is, can even be hot anger. We need to learn how, when we get angry, what are some of the things we need to do to cool off? Anybody have any suggestions? You're angry, what's the best thing to do? Sister Cook. Sister Cook said the best thing to do is just walk away, leave. And to be honest, that's probably one of the best things to do. What's another thing? Come on, you angry folk. Hold your tongue. Don't respond back. And what's the number one thing we should do? Pray. How many of us have gotten angry and we're praying at the same time? Lord, help me to hold my tongue. Lord, help me. We can control ourselves, but we can't control other people. But you can control yourself to the point that you can also help diffuse the situation. Let's look at number four. The fourth. Fourth. Make sure you have your support system in place. If you're going to set some limits with a person who has controlled you with anger, talk to the people in your support system first and make a plan. Know what you will say. Anticipate what the angry person will say and plan your reaction. Okay, stop right there. Who is the best support system that you have? Jesus is number one. Who else? My family. Your family. Who else? Myself. <laughs> well, definitely yourself. <laughs> Who else? Your church family. Okay. Any of you have a confidant? Yes. Sometimes that could be the best person that you need to confide with to help you dealing with an angry person. And also dealing with yourself if you have an anger issue. Now, I'm not going to ask this question. I mean, I'm going to ask this question, but you don't have to raise your hand. Do some of us have an anger issue ourselves? Yes. And we need to know how to deal with it. And sometimes, if we don't have a person that we can confide in or support group, it can lead us to have a miserable life. And it's one thing about having a miserable life if you're in the world. That's the world. That's fine. But why have a miserable life when you're a Christian? I mean, you should be preparing for heaven because heaven is our ultimate goal to reach. But we can't get there if we're not prepared here on earth. This, this is what earth is for. You're here to prepare you for heaven. This is your training ground. You're in school. 
to graduate to heaven. But if you fail the course, are you going to stand before God and say, well, 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 Lord, I repeated the course four and five times, but I think I deserve to get in. No, ma'am, and no, sir. So here, it's a learned behavior, and if we have learned that kind of behavior, now we got to learn how to, I got to change. Can we change? Yes, because you wouldn't be sitting here if you hadn't changed. Because you left that one state, which is in the world, now you have come into another state. But guess what? You brought some baggage with you. Come on, we got to get rid of some of this luggage. But at the process of it, now we're becoming better. Are you the same you were last year? You shouldn't be. Each day, each year, we should become closer and closer and closer to God. When we first came into the body, we were excited. We heard the good news. We obeyed the gospel. But we still had a lot of luggage and baggage with us. So now, over the course of the years, we have learned how to cut some of it loose so that your bag is no longer a trailer. Now it might be a handbag because we still got some stuff, but we still by the grace of God, is giving us opportunity to even get rid of that. Okay, so let's look at the fifth thing. Fifth, do not allow the angry person to get you angry. Keep a loving stance while speaking the truth in love. When we get caught up in the eye-for-eye mentality of the law or the returning evil-for-evil mentality of the world, we will be in bondage. If we have boundaries, we will be separate enough to love. And see, that's our boundary, where the Bible says in Ephesians 4, 6, be ye angry, and what? And sin not. And in James, you know, 1, 9 through uh, 19 through 20, be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, because does wrath does not do what? It does not work the righteousness of God. And see, it's one thing when you are angry, but if you can be able to control it, you know, that's you showing, I got self-control. You ever heard somebody say, well, this is the way I am. Really? Do you have to be like that? No. No. But, but we'll talk about this later. Some people don't know how to do better because they think this is what I need to be because it makes me happy. No, it don't. We are most miserable when we cannot enjoy life and enjoy the relationship one with another. Let's look at number six. The six. Six. Be prepared to use physical distance and other limits that enforce consequences. One woman's life was changed when she realized that she could say, I will not allow myself to be yelled at. I will go into the other room until you decide you can talk about this without verbally attacking me and raising your voice. When you can do that, I will talk to you. Now see here, like Sister Cook said, sometimes you need to separate yourself. Because when a person comes to you angry, you don't have to stand there. You need to get some distance so that that person can cool down. Uh, Brother Atkins, can you bring a scripture up for me? If you can bring up Proverbs 15.1. How do you cool a person down who comes to you that's angry? You take your karate stand? Yeah, right. Brother, brother. Brother Davis, yeah, but you know, I got a black belt. Now, you can try if you want to. <laughs> Do you take that karate stand? Can you give me Proverbs 15.1? And also, you can follow that up with uh, Colossians 4.6. Because 
I'm going to give you my experience as a police officer. I have encountered a lot of angry, <laughs> I want to use a good word. I have encountered a lot of angry people when I'm out enforcing the law. And they are angry at me because they broke the law. Now, they're going to say whatever, I'm not going to repeat those words, but they're going to say whatever comes out of their mouth. Now, I'm sitting here with a nine millimeter on my hip and a nightstick on the other side and mace in the center. Now, if I could not control my anger, what do you think I would do? <laughs> I'll use everything on my gun belt and say, what, who do you think you're talking to? No, but Proverbs, you got it yet, brother? <laughs> but sometimes when a person comes to you and they're angry, even to the point they are in a rage, and if you don't have it, Brother McKinley, can you turn to it? Proverbs 15, 1. Uh, Proverbs 15 and 1. Mm -hmm. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. You hear what, the, what Solomon's saying? Soft words turn away wrath, but grievous words stirs it up. So it's almost like tit for tat. But if a person, and if you didn't experience that, a person comes to you, they're angry, but you speak softly to them, that was one of the experiences that I actually experienced. I had a person, I stopped them, they were angry. And I just spoke to them very softly and nicely. By the time we was over with, I'm giving them a ticket, and they're saying thank you. <laughs> Praise God. I will just say, I got to give God the glory. But a soft word will turn away wrath. It will turn away anger. Colossians 4.6. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Choose your words wisely. If you choose your words wisely, you can help diffuse a situation that can be escalated to a point where it could become physical. And see, this is not so much in the world. This is also can be used in your home, anywhere, and in church. We had some angry Christians at time, but just saying a soft word to them and say, Brother Cook, you know, who gets the most anger? The preacher. And you got a member coming and kicking the door, and I want to talk to you. Right, Brother Cook? And say, Brother Cook is not packing, so he's just saying, okay, where's my escape route? Just in case. But he has to talk in a calm voice. Uh, brother, what, what seems the problem? You know, let's, let's calm down. Let, let, let's talk. What's going on? And then by the time they have calmed down, you know what they'll say at the end? No, not only thank you, but... I'm sorry. And see, that's you learning how to control your anger to help someone else with their anger because their anger is not your problem. It's theirs. But learning how to, number one, answer them can help them to see you have to deal with that. And most people will get angry at you because you are not giving them what they want. They do not want to accept no. And see, that's why God had to let the Israelites go. Because they kept leaving God and worshiping and chasing idols. And God said, I'm trying to protect you, but you know what? 
I got to let you go. And that's the same thing that we have to do with, with some of our family members and close friends. I have to let you go. But let's look at the guilt messages. Can we go back to the PowerPoint, brother? And Brother McKinley, we are on page 273, and let's read the first paragraph. Or the first two paragraphs, rather. Are we on the guilt messages or at the top? Uh, we're at the guilt messages where it says, a man telephoned his mother. A man telephoned his mother, and she answered the phone very weakly, with hardly any voice at all, concerned, thinking she was sick. He asked her, mother, what's wrong? I guess my voice doesn't work very well anymore, she replied. No one ever calls me since you children left home. So here she's giving her, sending her son guilt messages. When thinking about life, remember this. No amount of guilt can solve the past, and no amount of anxiety can change the future. That's one thing about guilt. We got to let it go because you can't change it. Once it happened, it has happened. And worrying or anxiety can't dictate the future. So here, we have to learn how to deal with guilt, but most of all, understand that I can't change it. At this time, the brothers are coming forth for Sunday suit collection, if you can make preparations as they're going forth. Guilt is not built into our DNA, and it harms our souls, personality, and even our health. Do you know guilt can put you in the hospital? Guilt can make you miserable in your relationship with others. Learning how to deal with guilt and then not let it control your life. But let's look at some of the guilt messages that you're going to hear from those who want to put you up on a guilt trip. What's some of the messages? How could? How could you do this to me after all I've done for you? You know, that, that's the number one. How, how could you do this to me? After all I've done for you. And you say, well, wait a minute, what did you do for me? What's another one? It seems that you could think about someone other than yourself for once. Oh, my goodness. Now, you know, that's, that's one. If you're not careful, it calls you to, who are you talking to? <laughs> What's another one? If you really love me, you will make this, phone, this telephone call for me. Uh, you know, I get that from some family members. Now, if you, you ever heard that? Now, if you love me. Mm. What's another one? It seems like you would care enough about the family to do this one thing. Continue. How can you abandon the family like this? Keep going. You know how it's turned out in the past when you haven't listened to me. After all, you never had to lift a finger around here. It seems like it's time you did. <laughs> you know that if I had it, if, you know if I had it, I would give it to you. And wait a minute, but you never had it. But see, that's putting that on a guilt. They want to throw it in, on you. Now, you know if I had it, I would give it to you. But you never had it. Continue. You have no idea how much we sacrifice for you. Now, that's a parent guilt to the children. And to be honest, the parents have sacrificed a lot for their children. But don't throw it up in their face. Don't put them on a guilt trip because they're not doing what you want them to do. That's the parent trying to control the children. Continue. Maybe after I'm dead and gone, you'll be sorry. Go ahead and die. <laughs> but that's cruel to say that. That's cruel to say to anybody. Because you won't be around to find out they're sorry or not. They might be glad. <laughs> but here, these are guilt trip phases 
that a person wants to put on someone who has probably told them no. But the next set, now this is the church talk, the God talk, guilt. Let's go with that one. Sometimes guilt manipulation comes dressed up in God talk. How can you call yourself a Christian? Whoa! That's the biggest guilt message that anybody can say to anybody that's, a body, that's part of the body of Christ. And you call yourself a Christian? Sister Stansel. Can you... Oh, hold on one sec. Uh, can you turn the mic on? Number 30. 28. Try it now. Is that good? Yes. Okay. I was saying that I had to do an eviction a few years ago, and these people um, had not paid rent and almost a year, and I had been, you know, steadily being kind-hearted and not on them or what have you. And because of that, they never paid attention to any of the court notices. So the day of the eviction, they were totally surprised, but they stood out there for, I don't know how long, for hours, and the rest of the neighborhood was, you know, with them and what have you. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing that they kept saying was, she called herself a Christian, and she, you because know, I had been tr inviting mm -hmm. them to mm -hmm. come. And it was very hurtful. Yes. And it took all that I could not to rescind and, you know, the eviction and, and work with them even mm -hmm. more, but I knew that was not the smart thing to do, but they had a whole crowd of people mm -hmm. talking about, and she's supposed to be a Christian. Oh, my goodness. It was very hard. It was hurtful, hard embarrassing, yeah. because you did what a Christian should do, and because they failed to do what they were supposed to do, now they want to put the guilt on you. That's the guilt message, and you call yourself a Christian. And see, that's, that's the God talk. And that's one that they will get you every time. But you stand strong, stand firm. Um, brother, brother Goodwin, brother Goodwin, I got two people up front, brother Davis and then uh, sister Goodwin. Wait a minute, wait a minute, hold it, uh, Gary. Brother Davis, and then Sister Goodwin. Brother Davis. Okay. Gotta put your hands up. <laughs> he did, brother. <laughs> okay. On this guilt, uh, you mentioned an inner and an outer. Mm -hmm. The inner guilt that's not coming from other people, but that you manifest within yourself, can be extremely poisonous to yourself. Mm -hmm. It's an imposed punishment that can last a lifetime, that can hinder you from ever growing spiritually, uh, your job-wise, or whatever. This harmfulness can lead to, here's an example of uh, guilt. Judas Iscariot mm -hmm. betrayed our Lord. Mm -hmm. He was so guilty he ran to the Pharisees and the rulers, and when they rejected him, he killed himself. Mm -hmm. This can also make you go kill someone else. Yes, yes. Great point, because, see, sometimes we got to be careful that we ourselves, as Brother David said, don't have embedded guilt ourselves. 
because then sometimes that can cause you to give in to the guilt messages. But we got to stand strong. No, we all have to be held accountable for our own action. Yeah, we can bear one another's burden, but every man has to bear their own burden. Okay, before we get to Sister Dooley, Sister, uh, can you turn the other mic on, brothers? Good morning. Um, <clears throat> um, I can sympathize with uh, Sister Stansel. I have a couple of coworkers that are, um, they're gay. And, and, and what's so odd about this is that I am the complete in of the office, and they find their way to my desk. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, often when they, they think that they've thought of a point, like they think, I got you, they, they find their way to my desk. But anyway, um, this one particular time, uh, this young lady, she brought in her wedding album. You know, she brought in her wedding, you know, some coworkers was like, oh, bring in your, your photo album from the wedding, you know, we want to, you know, see pictures, whatever. And my, my uh, coworker that sits across from me, you know, they brought the book to her and she was looking at it and, you know, and when she finished, she went to go hand it back to them. And she said to them, and she, oh, we, we know, you know, we know she don't want to see it. Do you want to, you want to see it? And I said, no, no, thank you, I'm good, you know. And uh, she said, oh, um, I don't know why you don't want to celebrate our marriage. That's of God. I said, marriage is of God, but that is not of God. All right, sister. Yeah. And, and, I, and I said, you know, because she went there, you know, and you're supposed, you, you know, you're always talking about God. And, you know, and I, I just... I can see why it struck a chord because you're always thinking, you're always, we're always in our, it's in our nature mm -hmm. to, we are not trying to bring a reproach against the church. So we don't ever want to make the church look bad. So when someone says, and you're supposed to be a Christian, and then you know you're in a public setting and everybody in the office is looking, you know, and when she walked away, my, my coworker, she said, you know, she already knew that you didn't want to see that photo album. That's why she made sure she came down here with it. She already knew you didn't want to see it. She made a point of inviting me to the wedding. We don't, we don't talk unless she's bringing her, trying to bring one of her arguments. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that rapport in the mm -hmm. first place. But why she, she felt like she wanted to invite me to the wedding. She felt like she wanted to tell me that they were trying to adopt you know, and, you know, oh, you know, we're having a, a, a party, a get-together, a cookout celebrating the kids. You know, we're adopting, our adoption went through. And I was just like, you know, this is nothing to celebrate, you know. But it, it, I understand where she was coming from because in, in the, uh, the attack is, is the thing because I'm sitting down the other end, mind my business. Well, one thing you know, I can say, sis, I'm glad you stood your ground because, Good point. no. Even though they said, well, you're supposed to be a... No, God does not celebrate that. Gary, got a good one. Got Sister Dooley. Sister Dooley, okay. My bad. <laughs> I'm trying to keep up. Not only do other people do it, but your family members that are not in the church and not baptized, they do it. Because my brother, he's like... Your, your, per, your co-worker, and this morning he puts his quote-unquote husband on the phone and says, tell your brother-in-law. I said, he ain't my brother-in-law. And he, he puts that on me. Well, you're supposed to be a Christian. You're not supposed to judge. I said, I'm not judging. I'm just telling you what the Word says. The Word says husband and wife, Adam and Eve, not Steve and Steve. Mm -hmm. So, no, you're, you're, that's not your husband. Marriage is not man and man. All right, sister. Stand and your ground. Stand he says it to me ground. all the time. You, you're supposed to be a Christian. You, you're holier than thou. You know you do things wrong. I said, yes, I do. I didn't say I was perfect. But when I sin, I ask God for forgiveness, and I don't do it again. 
Very good. Thank you, Sister Duda. Thank you for sharing your, your, your personal experience because, like I said, you're going to get that God talk. And let's go ahead, and um, we, we got a couple more minutes. What, what's some, so some more of the God talk dressed up, but it's really guilt? Doesn't the Bible say honor your parents? Now, see, that's a parent trying to put the guilt on their children. Yeah, the Bible does say honor your parents, for this is right if you want to live long. But also, sometimes it's, it's, it's something when sometimes children got correct parents. Yeah, I, I know, Dad, but I'm not able to do that. And see, here, Dad wants to control the son. And, and we'll get to that because if Dad can control the son, Dad's not always going to be around forever. So what is the son going to do when dad's gone? What's another one? You're not being very submissive. I'm sure that grieves the Lord. Now this is a, <laughs> now this is a husband abusing his wife. The Bible says you're supposed to be submissive unto the husband as unto the Lord in all things. Now that's a husband putting the guilt on the wife and abusing her because he does not want to accept no. So now he's going to put the God talk on his spouse. What's, what's the other one? I thought Christians were supposed to think of others. Yeah, we do. And sometimes when I think of others, I have to think of what I need to do to help you to stand and be responsible. I am thinking of you. Let me give you the reason why you need to do this yourself. The next one. What kind of religion would teach you to abandon your own family? Oh, now, that's, that's the one that's the non-Christian who's trying to put the guilt on the Christian. Now, what religion tells you to abandon your family? What? And let's look at the last one. You must really have a spiritual problem to be acting this way. Now here, <laughs> who put them in God's seat? To tell you you're not being spiritual. But see, these are the talks that you will get from those who have the guilt messages because they want you to do something and you are... You don't want to do it, and rightfully so, no, because they are irresponsible adults who's coming to you who don't want to take accountability for themselves. But again, when you have another one, anybody have a question back here? Okay, so we're going to stop right there, but prayerfully, next week we're going to talk about uh, how to recognize the guilt messages. Guilt messages are really anger in disguise. Guilt messages hide sadness and hurt. If guilt works on you, recognize that this is your problem and not theirs. And see, this is what Brother David said. Sometimes if the guilt message works on you, then you have a problem with guilt within. And do not explain or justify. Sometimes you don't own an explanation. And be assertive and interpret their message as being about their feelings. Don't make them or let them try to make it your problem. You have to stand and say, wait a minute. That's something you're going to have to deal with. So, Lord's will, class, you've been great. We'll pick it up next week, and then we'll talk about consequences and counter moves. You've been good this morning. Thank you for your participation and the questions that were asked. So, let's go to God in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time in prayer. We thank you, dear God, for the blessing you've given us this day. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have blessed us. We're able to gather today on this day that man has set aside for Father's Day. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the fathers. We pray to God that you bless them and help them, dear God, to always be the foundation of their family. Pray to God that you bless this congregation. Be with those that are traveling, dear God, and be with those, Heavenly Father, that are bereaved and those that are sick and shut in. Bless this congregation, dear God, our work that is pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Be with us as we depart from our morning uh, Sunday school and about ready to go into our morning worship service. Watch over, protect us, keep us always in your love and in your care. In your Son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Sundays at Central make a difference in my life, in your life. Sundays at Central make a difference in my life, in my life. The Central Church of Christ is a family-oriented congregation that believes that Jesus the Christ is the head of the church and that the Bible is right. We're comprised of a group of committed, imperfect people who are striving to walk with our Lord and Savior. Yes, Sundays at Central make a difference, but we want to ensure that we're impacting your daily lives. We're dedicated to making a difference, not only in the lives of our church family, but also in our surrounding communities. Central offers several classes, ministries, and programs for people of all ages that we're confident will fit your needs. We'd love to show you why our congregation is the right church home for you. So stop on by and join us for worship service so that you can experience how Sundays at Central make a difference. Welcome to Central Church of Christ, where Sundays at Central make a difference. Come on, come on, stop on, stop on by. We want to show you love. Come on, come on, stop on, stop on by.